I'll open up while he does that. Good. Perfect. All right. Rock and roll. This is Robin Matlock, CMO of VMware, and you're watching the Cube. This is John Siegel, VP of Product Marketing at Dell EMC. You're watching the Cube. This is Matthew Morgan. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Druva, and you are watching the Cube. This Live from Midtown Manhattan, it's the Cube covering Big Data New York City 2017. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media and its ecosystem sponsors. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a special Cube live presentation here in New York City for the Cube's coverage of Big Data NYC. This is where all the action is happening in the big data world, machine learning. AI, the cloud, all kind of coming together. This is our fifth year doing Big Data NYC. We've been covering the Hadoop ecosystem, Hadoop world since 2010. It's our eighth year really at, at ground zero for the uh, Hadoop, now the big data, now the data market. Uh, we're doing this also in conjunction with Strata Data, which was Strata Hadoop. That's a separate event with O'Reilly Media. We are not part of that. We do our own events, our fifth year doing our own event. We bring in all the thought leaders. We bring in all the influencers. We bring in the entrepreneurs and the CEOs to get the real story about what's happening in the ecosystem. And of course, we do it with our analysts at wikibon.com. And I'm John Furrier with my co-host, Jim Kobielis, who's the uh, chief analyst for our data piece, lead analyst, Jim. Um, you know, the data world's changed. We had commenting uh, yesterday all up on youtube.com slash siliconangle. Day one was really set the table. We kind of get, the, get the, the whiff of what's happening. We can kind of feel the trend. We got a finger on the pulse. Um, two things going on, two big notable stories is the world's continuing to expand around community and hybrid data and all these cool new data architectures. And the second kind of sub story is the O'Reilly show has become basically a marketing event. They're making millions of dollars over there. Um, a lot of people were last night kind of like not happy about that and then what's giving back to the community. So again, the community theme is still resonating strong. You're starting to see that move into the corporate enterprise of which you're covering. Um, what are you finding out? What did you hear last night? What are you hearing in the hallways? What is kind of the, the, the tea leaves that you're reading? What are some of the things you're seeing here well, in New York City? All things hybrid. I mean, first of all, it's, it's uh, you know, building hybrid applications for hybrid cloud environments. And there's various layers to that. So you know, yesterday on theCUBE, we had, for, you know, for example, one layer is hybrid semantic virtualization layers are critically important for bridging you know, uh, workloads and microservices and data across public and private clouds. We had, from at scale, we had Bruno Aziza and one of his customers t discussing what they're doing. I'm here hearing a fair amount of this venerable topic of semantic data virtualization become even more important now in the era of hybrid hybrid clouds. That's a fair amount of the uh, scuttlebutt and the uh, the hallway and atrium talks that I've I've participated in. Also yesterday uh, from BMC, we had Basil Faruqi talking about basically automating hybrid data pipelines or data pipelines in hybrid environments. Um, very, very important for DevOps, um, productionizing these hybrid applications for these new multi-cloud environments. That's, that's quite important. Um, hybrid data platforms of all sorts. Yesterday we had, uh, from Actian, we had Jeff Weiss discussing their, their portfolio for on-prem, yep. public cloud, you know, putting the data in various places and, you know, uh, and then speeding up the, the queries and so forth. So hybrid data platforms are going increasingly streaming in real time. What I'm getting is that what I'm hearing is more and more of the layering of these hybrid environments is a, is a critical concern for enterprises trying to put all this stuff together and, and future-proof it so that they can add on all the new stuff that's coming along like yeah. serverless clouds without breaking interoperability and without having to change code, um, just plug and play in a massively multi-cloud environment. You know, and also I'm critical of uh, uh, a lot of things that are going on, because to your point, the reason why I'm kind of critical on the O'Reilly show, in particular the, the hype factor going on in some areas, is that there's two kind of uh, trends that I'm seeing with respect to the entrepreneurs and some of the companies. You have one camp that are kind of groping for solutions, and you can see that with their whitewashing uh, you know, new announcements, this is going on here. Uh, and it's really kind of- Everything's AI now, by the way. And, and they're AI washing it, but the, but you can tell, <laughs> the tell sign is, you know, if they're always kind of like doing a magic trick of 
or some sort of new announcement, something's happening, you got to look at underneath that and say, okay, where is the deal for the customers? And you brought this up uh, yesterday with Peter Burris, which is the business side of it is really the conversation now. It's not about the speeds and feeds and the cluster uh, management. No, it's it's certainly important, and those solutions are maturing. That came up yesterday. The other thing that you brought up yesterday I thought was notable was the real emphasis on the data science side of it. And that it's still not easy for data science no. to do their job. And this is where you're seeing productivity conversations come up with data science. So really the emphasis at, at the end of the day boils down to this. If you don't have any meat on the bone, if you don't have a solution that the rubber hits the road where you can come in and provide a tangible benefit to a company, mm -hmm. an enterprise, then it's probably not going to work out. And we kind of had that tool conversation, you know, as people start groping. So as buyers out there, they got to look and kind of squint through it and saying, where's the real deal? So, you know, that kind of brings up what's next. Yeah. Who's winning? How do you as an analyst look at the playing field and say, that's good, that's got traction, that's, got, that's winning. Mm, not too sure. How, what's, your, what's your analysis? How do you tell the winners from the losers and what's your take on, on some of the data science well, opportunities? First of all, you can tell the winners when they have an ample number of reference customers uh, who are doing interesting things. Interesting enough to get a jaded analyst to pay attention. Doing something that changes the fabric of work or life, whatever. Clearly, solution providers who can provide that um, are, you know, they have all the hallmarks of a winner, meaning they're, they're making money and they're likely to grow and, you know, yeah. so forth. Um, but also the hallmarks of a winner are those, in many ways, who have a vision and catalyze an ecosystem around that vision of something that uh, could be, maybe possibly be done before, but not quite as efficiently. Um, so, you know, for example, now, the way what we're seeing more in the whole AI space, deep learning, is, uh, you know, AI means many things. The core right now in terms of the buzzy stuff is, is deep learning for, you know, uh, being able to process real-time uh, streams of video and images and so forth. Um, and so what, what we're seeing now is that um, the vendors who, um, who appear to be on the verge of being winners are those who use deep learning inside some new innovation that has enough, that, that appeals to a potential mass market. It's something you put on your, uh, like an app or something that you put on your smartphone or it's something you'd buy at Walmart and install in your house. You know, the whole notion of cl clearly, you know, like Alexa and all that stuff. All, anything that takes chatbot technology, really deep learning powers chatbots, and, and, and is able to uh, drive a conversational UI into things that you wouldn't normally expect to talk to you and does it well in a way that people have to have that. Those are the vendors that I'm looking for um, in terms of those are the ones that are going to make a ton of money selling to a mass market and possibly, you know, you know and, and very much, you know, if they, once they go there, they're building out a, um, a revenue stream um, and a business model that they can conceivably take into other markets, especially business markets. You know, like Amazon, 20 something years ago when they got started in the consumer space as the exemplar of web retailing, who expected them 20 years later to be a powerhouse you know, provider of business cloud services? You know? So we're looking for the Amazons of the world that can take something as silly as a conversational UI inside of a, a driven by DL inside of a, a consumer appliance, and in 20 years from now, maybe even sooner, become a business powerhouse. So that's what, you know. Yeah, I mean, the thing that comes up and that I want to get your thoughts on is, is that you're seeing data integration become a continuing theme. The other thing about the community uh, play here is you're starting to see customers align with syndicates or partnerships, and I think it's always been great to have customer traction, but uh, as you pointed out, as a, as a benchmark, but now you're starting to see the partner equation because this is an open, decentralized, distributed internet these, these days, and, and it is looking like it's going to form differently than the way it was in the web, web days, and with mobile and connected devices with IoT and AI, a whole new infrastructure is developing, so you're starting to see people align with partnerships, so I think that's something that's signaling to me that the partnership is amping up. The people are partnering more. We had uh, Horton works on with IBM. People are partnering. Some people take a Switzerland approach where they partner with everyone. You had uh, when Disco partners with all the cloud guys. I mean, they have unique ITP. So you have this model where you got to go out and do, it, do th something, but you can't do it alone. Open source is a key part of this. So obviously that's part of the collaboration. 
this is a key thing. And then you got to check off the boxes. Data integration, deep learning as a new way to kind of dig deeper. So the question I have for you is, the impact on developers, because if you can connect the dots between open source, 90% of the software written will be already in open source, 10% differentiated, and then the role of how people are going to the market with the enterprise with a partnership. You can almost connect the dots and saying it's kind of a community approach. So that leaves the question, what is the impact to developers? Well, the, the impact to developers, first of all, is when you go to a community approach, and like some big players are going more community and partnership oriented in hot new areas like, if you look at some of the recent announcements in you know, chatbots and those technologies, we have sort of rapprochements between Microsoft and Facebook and so forth, or, or Microsoft and AWS. The impact for developers is that there's convergence among uh, companies that might have competed to the death in particular hot new areas like, you know, uh, like I said, uh, you know, chatbot enabled, you know, um, apps for, 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 for mobile uh, uh, you know, uh, scenarios. And so it cuts short the, the platform wars uh, fairly quickly, harmonizes around a common set of APIs um, for accessing a variety of, of competing offerings that really overlap functionally in, in many ways. Um, for developers, it's simplification around a, um, a, a broader ecosystem where it's not so much competition on the underlying open source technologies, it's now competition to see who penetrates the mass market with actually valuable solutions that leverage one or more of those um, erstwhile competitors into some broader synthesis. You know, for example, the whole you know, uh, ramp up to the future of self-driving vehicles, and it's not clear Who's going to dominate there? You know, will it be the the, the the vehicle manufacturers that are equipping their their, their cars with with all manner of computerized you know everything and to, to to do whatnot, or will it be the the up and comers? I mean, will it be the computer companies like Apple and Microsoft and others who get real deep and, and invest fairly heavily in self-driving vehicle technology and become themselves? the new generation of automakers in the future. So what we're getting at is that, you know, going forward, developers want to see these big industry uh, segments uh, converge fairly rapidly around broader ecosystems where it's not clear who will be um, uh, the dominant player in, in, in 10 years. The, the developers don't really care as long as there is consolidation around a common framework. It, to which they can develop fairly soon. And open source is obviously a key role in this, and how is deep learning impacting some of the contributions that are being made, because we're starting to see that the competitive advantage and the collaboration on the community side is with the contributions from companies. For, for example, you mentioned tens TensorFlow uh, multiple from times Google, yesterday yeah. from Google. I mean, that's a great contribution. If you're a young kid coming into the developer community, I mean, this is not normal. I mean, this wasn't like this before. People just weren't donating massive libraries of great stuff yeah. already prepackaged. So, um, on new dynamics emerging. Is that putting pressure on Amazon? Is that putting pressure on AWS and, and others? Um, yeah, it is. Um, first of all, there is a fair amount of, I wouldn't call it first mover advantage for TensorFlow. I mean, there's been a number of DL toolkits in the market, open source for the last several years, but they achieved the deepest and broadest adoption most rapidly, and now they are a, de de TensorFlow is essentially a de facto standard in the way that, you know, let me just go back, uh, betraying my age, if 30, 40 years ago, you had two companies called SAS and SPSS that quickly established themselves as the go-to statistical modeling tools. Okay. Then they, you know, they got an, a, a generation, our generation, of developers, uh, at least uh, data scientists, what became known as data scientists, to you know to standardize around. See, you're either going to go SAS or SPSF as if you're going to do data mining. Cut ahead to the 2010s. Now, you know the the new generation of statistical modelers. It's all things DL and machine learning, <coughs> and so you know SAS versus SPSS. That's ages ago. Those companies yeah. or those products still exist. But now, you know, what are you going to get hooked on in school? What are you going to get hooked on in high school, for that matter, when you're, when you're just uh, hobby shopping DL? You're probably going to get hooked on TensorFlow because they have the deepest and the broadest open source community where you learn this stuff. You learn the tools of the trade. You adopt that tool, and everybody else in your environment is using that tool, and you got to get up to speed. So the fact is, you know, that, uh, that broad adoption early on in a hot new area like DL uh, means tons. It means that essentially TensorFlow is the new Spark, 
where Spark, you know, once again, Spark just in the past five years came on real fast. And it's been eclipsed, as it were, on the stack of cool by TensorFlow, but it's a deepening stack of open source offerings. The, so the new generation of developers with data science workbenches, they just assume that there's Spark in there and increasingly they're just going to assume that there's TensorFlow in yeah. there. They're going to increasingly assume that there are the, the libraries of algorithms and models and so forth that are you know, floating around in the, in the open source space that they can use to bootstrap themselves fairly quickly. This is a real issue project. in the open source community, which we talked at when we were in LA for the open source summit, was exactly that, is that there are some projects that become fashionable. So for example, the Cloud Native Foundation, very relevant, but mm -hmm. also hot, re really hot right now. A lot of people are jumping on board the Cloud Native yeah. uh, bandwagon, and rightfully so. There's a lot of work to be done there, and a lot of things to harvest from that growth. However, the boring blocking and tackling projects don't get all the fanfare, but are still super relevant. So there's a real challenge of how do you nurture these awesome projects <coughs> that we don't want it to become like a nightclub where no one goes anymore because it's not fashionable. Some of these open source projects are super important and have massive traction but they're not as sexy or flourish with as uh, some well, of that. DL is not as sexy, or machine learning for that matter, is not as sexy as you would think if you're actually doing it because the, the grunt work, John, as we know, for any statistical modeling exercise is data uh, ingestion and preparation and so forth. That's 75% of the challenge for deep learning as well. But also for deep learning and machine learning, training the models that you build is where the rubber meets the road. You can't have a really strongly yeah. predictive DL model in terms of face recognition unless you train it against a fair amount of actual yeah. face data or whatever it is. And it takes a long time to train these models. That's what you hear constantly. I heard this constantly in the Well, APM that's a data, data challenge is you need models that are adaptive, you need real time. And I think oh, this uh, points to the real new way of doing things. It's not yesterday's uh, model, it's yeah. constantly evolving. Yeah, and it relates to something I read this morning, or maybe it was last night, um, that Microsoft has made a huge investment in AI and deep learning machine learning. They're doing amazing things. And um, one of the strategic advantages they have um, as a large established solution provider with a search engine, Bing, is that from what I've uh, been, I, this is something I've read, I haven't talked to Microsoft in the last few hours to confirm this, that Bing is a source of training data that they're using for machine learning and I guess a deep learning uh, modeling um, w for their own solutions or within their ecosystem, that actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, Google uses YouTube videos heavily in its deep learning as for training data. So, you know, there's the whole issue of if you're a pipsqueak developer, some, you know, I'm sorry, it sounds patriotic. Some people face kid in high school who wants to get real deep on TensorFlow and start building and tuning these, these awesome kick-ass models you know, to do face recognition or whatever it might be. Where are you going to get your training data from? Well, there's plenty of open source database, uh, you know, training databases out there you can use, but it's what everybody's using. Um, so there's sourcing the training data, there's labeling the training data, that's human intensive. You need human beings to label it. Um, you know, there was a funny recent episode, or maybe it was last season episode of Silicon Valley, that was all about machine learning and building and training models. It was, the, it was the hot dog, not hot dog episode. It was so funny, they bamboozled a class on the show, okay. fictionally, a bamboozled a class of, uh, of uh, like college students to, um, you know, to provide training data and to label the training data for this, this uh, AI algorithm. It was hilarious. But where are you going to get the data? And where are you going to label it? You a lot more work to do. I mean, yeah. that's basically what you're getting it's at. It's DevOps, you know, it, but it's grunt work. It's well, we're going to kick off day two here. This is the SiliconANGLE Media the Cube, our fifth year doing our own event, separate from O'Reilly Media, but you know, in conjunction with their event in New York City. It's gotten much bigger here in New York City. We call it Big Data NYC. That's the hashtag. Follow it on us on Twitter. I'm John Furrier, Jim Kubilis. We're here all day. We've got Peter Burris joining us later, head of Regis for Wikibon. And we've got great guests coming up. Stay with us. Be back with more after this short break. <laughs>